Very special thanks to Affordable Prestige Cars in Glastonbury for providing the vehicle in this review, of course, and if you are located in the southwest of the UK, or maybe even a little bit further afield, then of course you can check out their current stock and their Contact Us page by clicking the link right below this video in the description to of course see what vehicles they've currently got for sale, and of course potentially get them to deliver you a car, or source you a car across the UK. There are certain occasions for me when reviewing a car that I come across a vehicle that's so profoundly good, and so just straight up great at what it was designed to do, that it almost, ironically, becomes boring to talk about for too long. So, for the interests of keeping the video, well, interesting, I'm going to try and not make the video stick around for any longer than it needs to. Now, the vehicle in question is a car which is very easy to underestimate, and the used values tend to reflect that. You can find at least a handful of Alpina D3s on the market at any given time, at least here in the UK, and I'm sure that varies quite a bit from country to country. I would imagine probably there are more in Germany in that kind of area, maybe less in the States, a few in Japan perhaps, I could see it being a car that they would love there. Here in the UK, as I said, maybe a dozen or so, typically speaking. And the price range on these things used is kind of ridiculously cheap, the vast majority being about five to seven thousand pounds, sometimes closer to ten, but very rarely, and there are different generations of this car as well. Now this one is one of the older ones, the OG, if you will, of the D3 series. Now the story behind the car is kind of a cool one. It was a prime time for this car to come out. Audi was winning at Le Mans with their diesels, and the son of Alpina's owner actually ran in the Nürburgring 24-hour event in the late 90s in a diesel BMW and won. So they had this perfect blend of the right time, the right motivation, and thanks to BMW's excellent 3 Series platform, here seen of course in the E90 generation, which of course also birthed the E92 M3, which I also reviewed here on the channel, it's a fantastic platform to work from. BMW already had a great car, then Alpina took that great car and made it even better. And when I say they made it even better, the true genius, I believe, of what makes this such a great little car is that it's actually not too over the top. The styling is relatively subtle, which is nothing new for Alpina, that tends to be their style, and most Alpinas can be recognised from the larger chin splitter with the Alpina logo, and of course, those instantly recognisable multi-spoke wheels. Now we're going to come back to the wheels in a second, because you'll have noticed they're very big on this car. 19 inch rims look huge on the 3 Series, and that could very easily give it an awful ride. But it doesn't. And one of the reasons why is, of course, what Alpina have done to it. Now, the value for money on this thing was crazy back in the day, because this was only £4,000 more than the equivalent BMW 320D of the time. £4,000 is nothing for a brand new car, especially for an aftermarket tuned one. Now, of course, you'll be expecting for that price that they haven't done a huge amount to it. And that's kind of true and false at the same time, because this could have easily been just an absolute gimmick, which would have sold, you know, a few kits maybe, you know, just a visual upgrade, add some rims, add, you know, the bodywork, and then just left it at that. Maybe more of an attainable Alpina to increase interest in their other cars. But they didn't do that. In fact, the value for money is pretty insane for four grand, because you could easily pay that kind of money just to get a set of rims from the right or wrong place, depending on how you look at it. But what they also did is rework the suspension, remapped the ECU, fitted it with a larger turbo and intercooler, and improved the fuel injectors as well. So, what were the results? Well, it's already a turbo diesel engine, two litre straight four rear wheel drive, of course, and the standard engine was putting out decent enough power, it's not the top of the range at the end of the day. After they did this tuning though, it's a 200 horsepower car. Some say just under, some say just over. It ranges from about 197 to 211, depending really on where you look and who you ask. More impressively though, and of course more usefully for a daily driver especially, being that diesel engine, it's the torque that really got the improvement. 200 horsepower is good, 302 pound feet is a lot better. That's a really, really strong amount of torque, and to put that into perspective, that means that this car actually puts out about 50 pound feet of torque more than my Golf R32 or Evo 7. So that's a huge amount of torque for a car that's only got a 2 litre, it's only a 200 horsepower car, and it's a diesel, of course with diesel being the key as to why it has so much torque. Now the performance by today's standards is not going to rock your world, but for the time, 
certainly against hot hatches on the market, it was more than capable enough to run with them. 0-60, just over or just under 7 seconds. Let's give the car the benefit of the doubt and say 6.9, just to make it sound a bit cooler, and the top end speed is around the 145, 150 mile an hour region. But of course, being a diesel, the potential is there for it to be super, super practical as a daily driver. And because it's not some really big, really powerful diesel like my Touareg V10 was with 600 pound a year road tax, even the tax on this is way better than it easily could be, even in 2022. But for me, the thing that I love about this car, and the reason why I respect its engineering and that of BMW laying the groundwork for it, is because of this super strong combination of performance and economy that these cars have. Even BMW themselves, with the pretty undervalued overall 123D from a few years later, it's just a fantastic platform for economy and performance. This one has a similar kind of spec and a similar kind of economy. In fact, these cars can average up around 47, 48 miles per gallon. That is really impressive. And of course, if you take it on a motorway run, drop it into sixth and just cruise, you're gonna be getting way more fuel economy than that, over 60 to the gallon in some cases. But at the same time, with all of that torque, with the great acceleration, and, as you'll have seen from the video, of course, a manual gearbox. Now, the crucial thing about the choice of gearbox, and of course for someone like me, who is definitely more of an automatic aficionado in, you know, 99% of cases, if you do want an automatic version, you will have to go newer. Now, the good thing about that is, a newer car, of course, will have some updates and advantages, generally speaking, but also the newer ones aren't that much more expensive. So it might be something to consider if you are on the market. I will say though, I personally prefer the look of these older ones. I think they have almost like a, a homologation car look to it, like a road going version of a DTM car or a, an ETCC touring car. And I think that's kind of cool, especially with the big wheels and the chin splitter and that little tasteful ducktail wing on the back. Now, in terms of the overall package, it's improved, but it's not radical. And that's why I said that for four grand, it's perfect in terms of value for money, because that four grand was still 27,000 pounds. When this was brand new, it's crazy how much of a difference inflation has made to car prices, because these days, the equivalent car to this on the market would be a heck of a lot more than 27 grand, that's for sure. Now to come back to the point which I mentioned earlier on regarding its large rims, that for those who don't know is an easy way of ruining your car's ride. Having massive rims and low profile tyres will often make a car much much harsher on the suspension. That is not the case here at all. In fact the handling, the steering, the manners, the personality and the ride quality are fantastic on this car, there is no other way of saying it. Now it's commonly said, and I will agree, that at lower speeds these D3s have quite heavy steering. Personally, I think it's actually not bad, it's not like it's a tractor to turn, but the faster you go the more alive it comes, and for a diesel that's a big deal, because that is going to bring me to one of the downsides, one of the only downsides in fact, of this vehicle, but we'll get to that in a second. For now though, the handling is easily one of the best attributes that this car is working with, and I think there are two reasons for that. One is of course the work which Alpina did with the suspension, but also of course credit where it's due to BMW in the first place for making the 3 Series of really any generation a fantastic platform as a driver's car. It is kind of the BMW driver's car after all, especially in the M3 form, and the trickle-down effect of that kind of development is really seen here, because it's a lovely chassis, lovely cornering, and it's super fun. Now let's go to the negatives, or at least what you could perceive as a negative, and I use that term very loosely because it's not really, it's more of a personal preference. When I say about personality, that really can be hit and miss with a diesel. I've owned a diesel that was great, the Touareg. In its own way, it was a very characterful car, but still not really. You know, it kind of was and it wasn't at the same time. Then you have others which are just astoundingly good, like the BMW 640D, which I reviewed here on the channel and is possibly the most charismatic diesel I've ever driven. A truly fantastic car. This is somewhere in between. I would not say that this car feels like the most fun thing I've ever driven. There are certainly hot hatches of a similar kind of performance and maybe even sometimes a similar price, which can definitely give it a run for its money, something like the Clio 197 for example, but they're just a different kind of approach to performance, a different kind of approach to fun. And the crucial advantage which this one has 
is if you think about it, what are this car's rivals? Relatively boring diesel sedans. There aren't really many true rivals for this car at the time, and the only rivals which you could kind of squeeze into this mould would be something like maybe a Mazda 6 MPS, which isn't even trying to accomplish the same things that this car is. I'm sure there are one or two that I'm not thinking of, but generally, this is a sports sedan with absolutely phenomenal economy. Great boot space, great interior space, even for a taller driver like me, I was not cramped in this car at all, and that is a big deal, because I've driven sports and even super saloons before that were surprisingly cramped for space. Unfortunately, the Mercedes C63 AMG was one of them, because I love the car in every way except for space. This one, it's not a problem at all. It was great to sit in this, great to drive it, but in terms of the personality, that's where you have a bit of give and take. Because of two things in particular. One, with a diesel, they simply don't offer the same kind of performance as a petrol. For good and for bad. The good thing about it is they have relentless torque at any speed. And of course, once you get up into that power band between two and four and a half thousand RPM, it really does pull. You can hear the turbo spool up real nice and it pulls really, really strongly while still getting fantastic fuel economy. The downside is, of course, it doesn't sound as great as a hot hatch typically would, and that's not going to change that much, unfortunately, unless you do some heavy modifications to it, and even then it's still going to sound like a diesel, but the personality is different. I will say that the biggest saving grace of this car is how fun it is through corners. If it wasn't fun through corners, the fact that it is a diesel would be much more of an issue because what this car lacks in engine charisma, it makes up for in cornering charisma. So that's fantastic. Again, that's why the 640D was so good. It had everything. It felt charismatic in every way. This one, not so much with the engine, but definitely in the chassis, the steering, the fun factor. And for somebody who doesn't even like manuals, it was pretty good to use there as well. Now, regarding that power band, that has sometimes been a critique that some outlets and journalists have had, wherein it feels kind of narrow, pulls really well between two and 4,000, but outside of that, either way, bogs down a little bit or just doesn't quite have the power. I would agree with that. And again, if you had an automatic version, the car would mostly take care of that itself, keeping you in the right power band. But it's just something, you know, it's a downside of diesel engines. It, you can't really change that. It's just an aspect of the car's personality. In daily life, it's never going to be a problem because this is a, I would say, possibly perfect car for somebody who wants something that is quick, not fast per se, but definitely quick. It's nippy. It's great through corners, good, strong acceleration, easy to overtake under any circumstances. So it's got all those boxes ticked in a very hot hatch kind of way but also has great space, really comfortable ride, which a lot of hot hatches don't. It's not cramped, which a lot of hot hatches can be. The boot space and rear passenger space is way better than most hot hatches. And the fuel economy, I have to keep coming back to it because it is so damn good. 50 to the gallon can just blow most hot hatches out of the water in comparison. That's like a good 20 to the gallon more, and even more in some cases, than any hot hatch of the time could get. Of course, notwithstanding diesel hatchbacks, which could give it a good run for its money there. Overall, the value for money is insane on these cars. I don't think it's necessarily a car that's going to go up in value anytime soon, because people just don't appreciate these models for some reason. The advantage of that, though, is it means you can get an incredibly capable car for a dirt cheap price. And all of these on the market have really high miles. This one, for example, it's up around 120,000. But honestly, it feels like it hasn't even done half that. And I don't say that as a hyperbole, it literally does feel like it takes it in its stride. These engines are built for this kind of thing. Long distance miles, eating up the motorway, barely using any fuel, and getting really strong torque and performance at the same time. I would say this is easily up there with the absolute best diesels I've driven. And for anyone who doesn't like diesels or doesn't think they can be fun, I would urge you to try driving something like this because it might just change your mind. It's not going to change your mind in terms of the sound or having, you know, the kind of vibrance of something like an Alpha GTA or whatever of the time, but the sheer brilliance of its engineering, how capable it is in every way, that has to account for something. 
And for me, it accounts for a lot, because this is a fantastic little car for a ridiculously good price across the board, regardless of which one you buy on the market. So ultimately, if you are, of course, interested in more reviews, you can find many of the ones which I mentioned here on the channel. In fact, all the ones which I mentioned I've already done are here on the channel. And of course, you can find those by clicking the playlist shown here on the screen. But until next time, I'll see you then with more reviews. And of course, if you are an owner, as I always like to say, Drop your stories down below, maybe warnings, good points, bad points, but I suspect you probably already have. So I'll see you next time, and for now, as always, thanks for watching.